greatest prejudice began looking for something they could use as a pretense for driving out members of the church. They found what they wanted in 1833 when a church newspaper ran an article meant to help free blacks entering the state from encountering trouble with Missouri's fugitive slave laws. Resorting to patriotic language, Missouri vigilantes drafted a constitution, or mob manifesto, to draw sympathizers to their cause. The 1776 Declaration of Independence concluded with the words, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. The 1833 Mob Manifesto concluded with similar words. We agree to use such means as may be sufficient to remove them, the Mormons, and to that end, we each pledge to each other our bodily powers, our lives, fortunes, and sacred honors. Missouri vigilantes attacked the most senior church leader in the area, Bishop Edward Partridge, kidnapping him from his home, battering him repeatedly, partially stripping off his clothes, and daubing him in tar and feathers. Vigilantes also tore the Saints' two-story brick newspaper building completely to the ground. In the face of such violence, church leaders agreed that their people would leave, choosing flight over fighting. Later, however, they reconsidered and decided to seek legal redress for the crimes committed against them and to defend their rights as American citizens. Irked at the Saints' legal efforts, the vigilantes stepped up the violence against them, attacking Mormon homes, kidnapping and beating Mormon men, and threatening them if they did not leave the area. The means of whipping and torturing the Saints during this time period drew on techniques already honed by slaveholders on enslaved persons. Finally, the Jackson County leaders, including State Lieutenant Governor Lilburn W. Boggs, helped orchestrate the driving of the Mormons from Jackson County. Later, vigilantes torched many of the Mormon homes to discourage resettlement. One Mormon couple who did return to their home and garden in order to avoid starvation soon faced armed vigilantes who attacked the husband. Abigail Leonard testified that they struck her husband over the head with a chair, dragged him from the house, and then beat and whipped him until his life, she said, was almost extinct. Further efforts at seeking redress legally ran headlong into a system biased in the vigilante's favor. When Bishop Partridge sued for being kidnapped, stripped, tarred, and feathered, the defendants in their legal answer essentially admitted everything they did to him, but brazenly claimed that they did it, quote, necessarily and unavoidably in self-defense, doing no unnecessary damage, close quote. Partridge won the case, but got only a penny and a peppercorn as damages. No wonder the saints grew frustrated. They were following the rules that were supposed to protect citizens, but because of their status as members of a despised minority faith, the law did not adequately protect them from violence or provide redress after it occurred. The saints who were driven out of Jackson County sought refuge in neighboring Clay County. The agitators in Jackson County began making so much noise against the Mormons living in Clay County, however, that it affected the saints' sympathizers there who wanted to avoid trouble for themselves and their communities. Lyman White testified that vigilantes commenced catching the saints in the streets, whipping some of them until their bowels gushed out, and leaving others for dead in the streets. Once again, those who inflicted violence on the saints justified their crimes under the guise of patriotism. One mobber, who otherwise seemed to consider himself an upstanding citizen, wrote calmly to family members about the violence he helped to inflict. We are trampling on our law and constitution, he admitted in his letter, but we can't help it in no way while we are possessed with the spirit of 76, he claimed. Six of our party went to a Mormon town. Several Mormons cocked their guns and swore they would shoot them. After some scrimmaging, two white men took a Mormon out of company and gave him 100 lasses, lashes, and it is thought he will die of this beating. To avoid further trouble, the saints left Clay County and settled in Caldwell County a new county established, as David Whitmer later put it, to be a sort of Mormon reservation. At first, this seemed to settle the violence, but not for long. When saints outside the county were attacked and sought the assistance of now Governor Lilburn W. Boggs, he responded that the quarrel was between the Mormons and the mob and they should fight it out. Left on their own, the saints did their best to defend themselves and went on the offensive, making preemptive strikes to eliminate threats, disarm the enemy, and resupply their own people. A group of Missouri militia began driving Latter-day Saint families from their homes and took three prisoners. Mormons who mobilized to rescue them ended up in a firefight that became known as the Battle of Crooked River. 
Although Mormon casualties exceeded those of the Missourians, exaggerated rumors reached Governor Boggs that led him to issue an order to exterminate or drive the Mormons from the state. Near the same time, rogue militia attacked the largely Mormon village of Hans Mill and, ignoring cries for mercy, killed 17 men and boys and wounded many others. Before blowing off the head of a young boy found hiding under the bellows in the blacksmith shop, one vigilante exclaimed, Nits will make lice, a slogan used for generations by bigots to justify the killing of minority children. Soon the Mormon capital of Far West fell, the saints were forced to turn over their property to pay for the war, and Mormon leaders were imprisoned for months, eventually joining their fellow religionists in their new place of refuge, Western Illinois. The people of Illinois responded sympathetically at first, and the saints obtained a state charter for their new community of Nauvoo. The charter in many ways resembled that of other Illinois cities, but it was meant to benefit from the tragic civics lessons learned by the saints during their Missouri sojourn. Missouri taught them that if they were to obtain justice, they must be responsible for overseeing the municipal government and the courts, and they must have a strong militia. Shortly after arriving in Illinois, Joseph Smith went personally to Washington, D.C., seeking federal aid to assure that his people's civil rights were preserved at the state and local level against vigilante actions like those from which they suffered in Missouri. Martin Van Buren, the U.S. president, however, was a state's rights man and did not think the federal government should interfere with local matters. That meant preserving control of the local government was all the more important to the Latter-day Saints. If Nauvoo had remained a quaint community on the western border of the state with people eking out a quiet existence through trade or agriculture, as did many people in the surrounding towns, it may well have continued without substantial opposition. But rapid growth, fueled by conversion and emigration, led to economic and political jealousies and fears, which in turn allowed opponents to point out religious peculiarities as a way of generating opposition. Joseph Smith could see that it was only a matter of time before the horrors he and his people experienced elsewhere would be visited in Illinois. Without abandoning Nauvoo, he hoped to go west and build a new government that would recognize and preserve the civil rights of all people regardless of their religious beliefs. It was for that purpose that he founded the Council of 50. Later, he used the council to help promote his candidacy for President of the United States, a campaign he hoped would bring attention to the plight of the Latter-day Saints and other oppressed peoples. His assassination in June 1844 while in state custody ended his candidacy, but the Council of 50 lived on and became the basis for establishing a new government in what became Utah. None of what I have said today is meant to imply that Latter-day Saints were perfect or that they did not make mistakes of their own or resort to vigilante violence themselves at times. But the historical record on balance makes it clear that like so many other minority groups in antebellum America, the Mormons were more often the victims than the aggressors, and when they did go on the offensive, they were vilified for doing so, and their efforts were used to justify even harsher violence against them. For example, the actions of a few Mormons in the Battle of Crooked River were used to justify Governor Boggs' order to exterminate or drive the Mormons as a people from Missouri, while the, Mormon while the Missouri perpetrators of the much larger Hans Mill massacre were never called to account for their atrocities. Likewise, Missourians destroyed the Mormon printing press with virtual impunity, but when Mormons responded in a similar way to an opposition press in Illinois, opponents called for war and extermination, which resulted in the murders of Joseph and Hiram Smith and the driving of the saints from the state. It would take a civil war, civil rights legislation, and decades of court battles to get the kind of protection from minority rights that Joseph Smith sought in his lifetime. Meanwhile, the Council of 50 that he founded helped to guide the refugee saints to their new home in the American West. Thank you. Thanks very much, Rick. <clears throat> One of Rick's um, colleagues at, in the Church History Department is Matthew Groh, who is director of publications. He uh, super, supervises the Joseph Smith papers, uh, along with uh, other publishing projects that the department's working on. As much as anyone, he is responsible for guiding these massive ventures through the editorial process. Matt is a group of, who's one of a group of Latter-day Saints who received their degrees 
at Notre Dame under the tutelage of George Marsden, a very distinguished scholar of American religion. The book that came out of Matt's work at Notre Dame was Liberty to the Downtrodden, Thomas L. Cain, Romantic Reformer, which received the Mormon History Association Best Book Award. Subsequently, he authored with Terrell Givens, Parley P. Pratt, The St. Paul of Mormonism. He and Ronald Walker have also edited the letters of Brigham Young and Thomas Cain. So he's a very active scholar as well as a, an executive in the Joseph Smith Papers Project. He was in charge when the Council of 50 Minutes were being prepared for publication. And I want to thank him and the editorial board for their splendid work and give him now a chance to say what he thinks they mean. Thank you, Richard. Technology is not my strong suit, but we'll, I, think, I think this will happen. It's happening. I will say that I was unnerved as I walked into this room tonight to talk on the Council of 50. And I noticed a section over here reserved for the LDS Council. But I counted the seats. It was less than 50. I figured we were OK, whatever was going on. This is a really appropriate setting, I think, at the University of Virginia uh, to talk about the Council of 50 Minutes, which I think say a lot about uh, religious liberty. And, and, and I think it's particularly appropriate to, to do this the night before the Joseph Smith uh, lecture on uh, religious liberty. Like other people who have chosen uh, to make uh, Mormon history my profession, uh, I knew about the Council of, I've known about the Council of 50 Minutes for a long time. I uh, knew about the desire that perhaps these uh, minutes would someday uh, come to light. It was about four years ago uh, that Rick Turley and Reed Nielsen, uh, who, who's one of our colleagues at the Church History Department, asked me to meet with them. They had a transcript of those minutes, these minutes that had become sort of a, the holy grail of Mormon documents uh, with them. My task, they explained, was to write an introduction to the minutes that would help church leaders decide whether or not they should be published. No pressure. So some months later, uh, the highest church leaders, the First Presidency, decided that the minutes should be published as part of the Joseph Smith Papers. And since that time, a team of historians, including myself, Ron Esplin, Mark Hashers McGee, Garrett Dirk Mott, and Jeff Mayhoff, have worked on the minutes. The minutes are not a brief document. No, they're not. <laughs> Kathleen has been privileged to read through them, and she just has confirmed that they are not brief. They're a very complete account of these uh, meetings. They're really terrific in, in, in terms of historical detail. So Rick has done a great job of giving context for the reasons, at least some of the reasons, that the council was established. My task today is to give an overview of the minutes, where they came from, the, the priorities that they express uh, and uh, during the time of the, ex uh, the existence of the Council of Nauvoo. These are the record books, three small books kept by William Clayton, who was an English convert to the church and clerk of the council. He first kept minutes on loose sheets of paper that he would then copy into these permanent record books. Council members emphasize confidentiality, including the need to safeguard the minutes. They believe that knowledge of their discussions regarding theocracy and the kingdom of God would increase the widespread belief that Latter-day Saints opposed key elements of American democracy. I'll just show you, a, uh, here's the title page of the minutes, the record of the Council of 50 or kingdom of God. They use those names interchangeably. This council was organized, and so on and so forth. You can see what a beautiful hand that William Clayton had. 
sometimes those of us who work on documents really have to scrutinize the document to understand what words are on the page. Not so with the Council of 50 Minutes. They're just beautiful. Here's a list of the members. Uh, so they, they, they have these lists, starting with the standing chairman, Joseph Smith, and on down through the council. Even the existence of the council was supposed to be kept confidential. Let me show you how, the, how, how they would safeguard even this knowledge of the council. This is a record kept by a church leader named William Richards in March 1846. So you see that last line there, selected by the council, and then he has written a reference to the council, but in such a way as to encode it from prying eyes. What does he call it? The Council of YTFIF. Now, perhaps that code might have been broken had someone <laughs> puzzled it out. But let me show you one more uh, reference. This is 80 years later. George Cannon writing to John Taylor and Joseph F. Smith, all high church leaders. And George Cannon writes about the Council of Canalima. This is better code. George Cannon and Joseph F. Smith had both been missionaries in their young years to Hawaii. Council of 50 in Hawaiian. So you can see this concern even 30 years after the council's existence in Nauvoo to safeguard even the mention of talking about uh, the council. But that, that concern existed all along. Five days before Joseph Smith's murder, he called William Clayton uh, to him, and knowing that he would soon be arrested and perhaps murdered, he ordered Clayton to either burn or bury the records of the council. Clayton buried them in his garden and dug them up a week later after Smith had died. Following the exodus from Nauvoo in 1846, the record books were taken to Utah and the minutes continued to be closely guarded. They became part of the records of the church's first presidency, where they remained until they were transferred to the church's history library in 2010. The minutes have never been previously available, I think, for two key reasons. First, because they were considered so confidential during the council's meetings that later stewards of the records took that confidentiality very seriously and wished to honor it. And second, because once they were in the possession of the First Presidency, they were seldom used or read by church leaders, and there was no pressing reason to make them available. That reason came as part of the, jo the, the church's commitment to publish all of Joseph Smith's papers as part of uh, this papers, this documentary editing project. So what did the council do? The minutes of the council's first... Uh-oh. What have I done? The minutes of the council's first official meeting read, all seem to agree to look to some place where we can go and establish a theocracy, either in Texas or Oregon or somewhere in California. Note that all three of these options are outside of the borders of the United States in 1844. The members of the council saw its formation as the beginning of the literal kingdom of God on earth and anticipated that the council would one day govern men in civil matters. Members were drawn both to the possibility of relocating Latter-day Saints outside of the United States, where they could create their own government, and to the possibility of creating a better government within the United States. In the first months of his existence, council members discussed at length the nature of the kingdom of God. For most contemporary Americans, theocracy connoted the tyrannical rule of religious leaders, conjured images of the collusion of Catholicism with European governments, and seemed the antithesis of American democracy. However, Joseph Smith believed that theocracy could be fused with the best elements of democracy, a system he called theodemocracy. Council members believed that a theodemocracy would protect rights of minority groups, allow for dissent and free discussion, involve Mormons and others, and increase righteousness in preparation for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Sidney Rigdon, one of Smith's counselors, stated, the design was to form a theocracy according to the will of heaven, planted without any intention to interfere with any government of the world. You need not fear that we designed to trample on the rights 
of any man or set of men only to seek the enjoyment of our own rights. And indeed, council members emphasize that in, under the kingdom of God, everyone would have religious liberty, and they included three men who were not members of the uh, Latter-day Saint faith on the council to demonstrate this principle of religious liberty. The council's name, which was given in a revelation to Joseph Smith during a council meeting, suggests this mix of political purpose and religious symbolism. The kingdom of God and its laws, but the keys and powers thereof in the hands of his servants. Council members thought that was a bit long, so they referred to it uh, as the kingdom, or the kingdom of God, or the council of the kingdom. After the council reached about 50 men, Joseph Smith declared it full, and thereafter it was also known as the Council of Fifty. In the midst of these discussions on the kingdom of God, the council unanimously voted to receive Joseph Smith from this time, henceforth and forever, as our prophet, priest, and king. This demonstrates their views of theodemocracy, under which the ecclesiastical leader of the church priest and prophet, would be chosen by them as political leader, king. They understood that this action would have no immediate political consequences, but it symbolized their desire to prepare for the millennial kingdom of God. It also reflected Mormon temple ceremonies, that in the view of Latter-day Saints would allow men to one day become, in the words of John the Revelator in the Bible, unto our God's kings and priests. Joseph Smith was publicly urging the Latter-day Saints at this time to uh, finish a temple in Nauvoo, a religious edifice where they would receive uh, religious ceremonies uh, that they termed the endowment. He said that under these ceremonies, uh, they would be made uh, kings and priests unto the Most High God. This had nothing to do with temporal affairs, he said, but was related to this kingdom of God. Nevertheless, the, view that jo the belief that Joseph Smith had been crowned king of the Mormons, quickly spread. So common were these rumors that Illinois Governor Thomas Ford, after Joseph Smith was killed, proclaimed them first on the list of excite, uh, things that excited uh, Illinoisans and led to his death. So some surely expected that within these minutes there would be a description of an, an elaborate coronation ceremony. Not so. Uh, rather, his associates receive him with this religious language of prophet, priest, and king. Council members also debated the relationship between the kingdom of God, or the council, and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Though church leaders were central participants in the Council of Fifty, it was not an ecclesiastical body. It did not appoint church officers, teach doctrines, or perform religious ceremonies. Joseph Smith explained, there is a distinction between the church of God and the, and the kingdom of God. The laws of the kingdom are not designed to affect our salvation in the hereafter. The church is a spiritual matter and a spiritual kingdom. But this kingdom, he said, was designed to be God up for the safety and salvation of the saints by protecting them in their religious rites and worship. Under Brigham Young's leadership, well, and, and I will also mention that one of the priorities of the council under Joseph Smith was to essentially manage his presidential campaign uh, in 1844 when he was running for the U.S. presidency. Under Brigham Young's leadership in 1845 and 1846 following Smith's murder, the council focused less on these wide-ranging discussions about millennial prophecies in the kingdom of God. Rather, they focused on more pragmatic concerns, especially how to respond to the, re to the repeal of their local city charter, the Nauvoo Charter. This deprived them of local government, local police force, a local militia. As they wrestled with the question of how to maintain order in a city of over 10,000 inhabitants without a government, council members discussed and at times implemented ideas to establish an extra legal police force to restore city government and to urge state leaders to reinstate this charter. In addition, the council increasingly looked to the West. Under Joseph Smith's leadership, the council had sent a delegate to meet with Sam Houston in the Republic of Texas and explored the possibilities of settlement in Oregon and California. Under Young, the council continued gathering information on the Western sites, explored among various Indian tribes, and hoped to find a new gathering place for the saints. 
During these 1845 meetings, in the shadow of the murder of Joseph and Hiram Smith, and with the growing realization of their tenuous situation in Nauvoo, council members lashed out in frustration and anger in their meetings. Brigham Young stated that he did not care about preaching to the Gentiles any longer. He said, let the damned scoundrels be killed. Let them be swept off from the earth. And then we can go and be baptized for them, easier than we can convert them. <laughs> he said, the Gentiles have rejected the gospel. They have killed the prophets. And those who have, taken, who have not taken an active part in the murder all rejoice in it and say amen to it. He believed that American governments had been too powerless or too corrupt to protect the Latter-day Saints' rights. And he vowed that he would not allow himself to be taken and murdered as the Smiths had been. Both the Latter-day Saints and their opponents, as Rick has talked about, accepted widespread notions about extra-legal vigilantism at this time. The Mormons continued to be targets of this vigilantism in this waning period of Nauvoo, and at times themselves expelled dissenters uh, from Nauvoo. Notwithstanding the often heated statements within the council, when faced with the possibility of armed conflict in Nauvoo, Young spoke of suffering wrong rather than doing wrong, and opted for a mass exodus rather than a pitched battle. During fall 1845, the council focused its plans to move west on the valley of the Great Salt Lake, and they acted as a planning body for that exodus that began in early 1846. I began by mentioning this connection with religious liberty that animates a lot of their discussions, particularly under Joseph Smith, and I'll just read a quote that I think gives a flavor of this animating concern. Joseph Smith said in the council, God cannot save or damn a man only on the principle that every man acts, chooses, and worships for himself, hence the importance of thrusting from us every spirit of bigotry and intolerance towards a man's religion, that spirit which has drenched the earth with blood. I will appeal to every man in this council, beginning at the youngest, that when he arrives to the years of old age, he will have to say that the principles of intolerance and bigotry never had a place in this kingdom, nor in my breast, and that he is even then ready to die rather than to yield uh, to such things. Thank you. You now have a preview of what you will find in these documents, which I hope many of you will go through. Uh, their, their complexity, their richness, the uh, the comments of people at these meetings are recorded at great length by William Clayton. He was very good at getting the words down, so you get a flavor of it and some of the themes that, uh, that uh, Matt has talked about. Now, what does this all mean? What does it tell us about sort of the way the Latter-day Saints were thinking in an American context, but also in this biblical context of the Second Coming? Nathan Oman is a graduate of Harvard Law School, associate professor of law at William and Mary, and Robert and Elizabeth Scott, research professor. He is one of those scholars who has a life of scholarship in his professional field while contributing frequently to Mormon studies. He has written a variety of articles about contract law and morality, and this year published The Dignity of Commerce, the Moral Foundation of Contract Law with the University of Chicago Press. On the church side, he's produced essays like Jurisprudence and the Problem of Church Doctrine or The Living Oracles, Legal Interpretation in Mormon Thought. He is one of the most astute of Mormon bloggers, always worth pausing to read, and I can guarantee you that tonight he will offer a big picture take on the Council of 50 Minutes. So Richard was very clear I'm not supposed to go over time. Um, so in March of 1844, uh, at the uh, opening, minutes, uh, opening meetings of the Council of 50, a committee was uh, appointed that consisted of uh, John Taylor, uh, Willard Richards, W.W. Um, Phelps, and Parley P. Pratt. 
This committee was charged with producing a written constitution for the kingdom of God, which they spent two, day, or two weeks trying to produce uh, such a document. Uh, they produced a draft constitution for the kingdom of God, which was reported to the Council of Fifty as a whole. The Council of Fifty as a whole, however, along with the authors of the document, expressed um, dissatisfaction with what they had produced, and it was sent back to committee to be revised. A week later, when the matter was brought up against the, uh, before the council for a third time, Joseph Smith received a revelation that he announced in the council ordering that the attempt to write a written constitution for the kingdom of God and its government uh, should be abandoned. Now, when you lay the story out in those terms, this sounds really weird uh, compared to the stories we usually hear about American history. Right? Breakaway Americans thinking that they're going to found uh, some independent government uh, within the United States or at least somewhere within North America writing their own constitution that's different from the United States Constitution. This seems to be radically outside the historical story that we tend to tell ourselves about the United States, which is one of manifest destiny and the gradual filling up of the North American continent, uh, first with territories and then with states which were admitted to the Union in an orderly process until we got the 50 states of the United States today. Um, so that story of orderly progress is wrong, it's false. Um, and it's only by understanding what's wrong about that story that we can see what was unique about what the Latter-day Saints were doing in March and April of 1844 in the drafting of this constitution and what was not unique. So first, um, it was by no means clear that the United States was going to occupy the entirety of North America uh, during the um, 19th century. In fact, one of the major questions, uh, geopolitical questions of the 19th century, the first half of the 19th century was, where would the borders of the United States be? It also wasn't at all uncommon for uh, American citizens to imagine themselves going out beyond the borders of the United States, or perhaps in spaces um, uh, disputed spaces at the borders of the United States and founding their own new republics for which they would write constitutions. And there's a long list of these republics. Uh, for example, Vermont began as a breakaway republic in 1791. Um, there was an attempt to create the state of Franklin, which would have been uh, part of what is today uh, Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Kentucky. In 1810, the Republic of West Florida was founded that had a Lone Star flag as its uh, banner. Uh, perhaps most spectacularly, Aaron Burr, who was Thomas Jefferson's uh, vice president, hatched a plan to break off the western part of the United States, form his own independent uh, country, and perhaps invade Mexico. It's never quite clear exactly what Aaron Burr was going to do, and he tended to tell different things to different people, so we don't know exactly. What we do know is that Thomas Jefferson caught him and tried to have him executed um, unsuccessfully. Um, uh, John Marshall, who sat in, uh, as the judge in the trial, wouldn't let Jefferson execute Aaron Burr. Um, in 1826, um, um, uh, or sorry, uh, in 1836, um, um, American settlers in what was then Mexico um, began a war and rebellion against the central uh, Mexican government and were able to detach all of Mexico uh, to the north and to the east of the Rio Grande and form the Republic of Texas which was an independent um, nation for 10 years with its own constitution, Congress, presidents, Supreme Courts, uh, laws, etc. cetera. Um, there was something in the 1830s called the Indian Stream Republic, which was a tiny um, mini republic that was founded on the northern borders between New Hampshire and Canada. There was disputes as to where that international boundary lay, and in that disputed territory, a little microstate was founded and operated for a number of years with its own constitution uh, and written laws. And then, of course, most spectacularly, from 1861 until 1865, the southern portion of uh, the United States tried to secede and form its own nation. So what we see when we look at the United States uh, in the antebellum period, and more generally in the antebellum period, is repeated attempts to create little micro-republics in the liminal spaces of North America. Without exception, um, when these little micro-statelets tried to um, start up, they wrote constitutions for themselves. And in fact, oftentimes or sometimes they wrote constitutions before they even got the state set up. There was a meeting in 1858 that was held in Canada 
in which John Brown and his followers authored a constitution and provisional set of laws for the United States. Uh, the next year, Brown and his followers led um, an attempt to start a, a slave rebellion in Virginia by seizing the federal arsenal at Harper's Ferry. Before they did that, they wrote a constitution that was going to govern this redeemed nation that they were creating. So seen in those terms, actually, the Mormon effort to create a new republic someplace out there in uh, the western reaches of North America and write a constitution for it actually isn't all that radical, um, or at any rate, it's certainly not unique in American history. So what is unique? Um, two things in this process. The first is the role of religion. Now first, it should be noted that religion was actually played a part in these um, other alternative constitutions that were written. The Confederate Constitution, for example, invokes the name of God. Um, uh, strikingly, the uh, Constitution of 1787 does not mention God. John Brown's pro um, um, proposed Constitution for a redeemed United States speaks in very apocalyptic uh, terms um, about redeeming uh, the country from slavery, and that redemption is seen in Christian terms. Um, nevertheless, the Mormons were unusually religious in how it is they formulated their constitution. So what did they actually uh, uh, say in this document? Um, the document itself consists of a preamble and um, three articles. The preamble speaks in the voice of we the people of the kingdom of God and sets forth the reasons for the founding of this new nation. The three articles, however, speak in the voice of the Lord, in the first person, I, the Lord Jehovah, speak. So this is what the preamble sa says. We have supplicated the great I Am that he would make known his will unto his servants concerning this his last kingdom and the law by which the people shall be governed and the voice of the Lord unto us was verily thus saith the Lord this is the name which he shall be called the kingdom of God and his laws and the kings and powers thereof the judgment in the hands of his servant, servants and in Christ. This is far more religious than the confederate states of America sort of invoking uh, divine providence on their project. Why was such a new um, uh, government necessary? According um, to the preamble, all nations have obtained their power, rule, and authority by usurpation, rebellion, blood, bloodshed, tyranny, and fraud. The only legitimate source of government, according to the preamble, is a government instituted by God. Only God can be a legitimate lawgiver. All other lawgivers um, result in, quote, usurpation, rebellion, bloodshed, tyranny, fraud. It lacks the disposition and power to grant the protection of the person and rights of man, viz. the, life, the ru life, liberty, the possession of property, the pursuit of happiness, which was designed by the creator of men. What you see in this language is a fusion of ideas that are taken from the American Republican and Democratic tradition, the language, the echoes of the language that you see from the Constitution of 1787 and the Declaration of Independence, and infused with this is a very theocentric notion of government. The only legitimate governments are those governments instituted by God, because only God is the legitimate lawgiver. Then we get through the preamble and hear the voice of the Lord himself. It says, I alone am the rightful lawgiver of man. I, the Lord, will do nothing but what I have revealed or shall reveal unto my servants, the prophets, that I have appointed one man holding the keys and authorities pertaining to my holy priesthood, whom I will reveal my laws, my statutes, my ordinances, my judgments, my will and pleasures concerning my kingdom on earth. Strikingly in this document, it's only until you get to the very final article, Article 3, that you get anything that looks like what we think of constitutions as being about. That is, a set of procedures that would govern an institution that was actually a government. And the set of procedures um, that were laid out uh, say, my servant, my servant and prophet whom I have called and chosen shall have power to appoint judges and officers in my kingdom. And my people shall have the right to choose or refuse the officers by common consent. And if the judges or officers transgress, they shall be punished according to my laws. If you read the entire document, a few things stand out. One of the things that stand out is this couldn't possibly be a constitution of a functioning state. 
um, is no possible way that it could govern a functioning state. It doesn't have the level of detail that you would need. Unlike most constitutions, it's not an attempt. It doesn't copy from any other previous constitution. Well, generally speaking, um, uh, constitutions copy each other. The Confederate States Constitution copies verbatim big chunks of the Constitution of 1787. No large copyings in this. Um, and strikingly, this is an attempt to author a revelation from God. And that was what made people uncomfortable. When the um, document was reported back to the, co the committee, John Taylor said, um, if they, the committee, can get intelligence from God, they can write correct principles. If not, they cannot. And the implication being is they weren't sure that they'd done it when they produced this document. They weren't sure that they'd actually received uh, the will of the Lord as to what it was that they were supposed to produce. And so they were sent back to committee. Um, and that's when Joseph Smith, when they come back from that committee, that is when Joseph Smith gives his, pardon me, revelation. The revelation is very short. It says, Verily thus saith the Lord, Ye are my constitution, and I am your God. Ye are my spokesmen. From henceforth do as I command you, saith the Lord. That's it. And with that revelation, they abandon any attempt to write a written constitution uh, for the kingdom of God. They often stead for an unwritten uh, constitution, a living constitution, um, and a constitution based on the idea of continuing revelation and prophecy. Um, now, the meeting, the minutes of the Council of Fifty were kept confidential for many, many uh, years until the present. Um, however, there were people who knew about this revelation, the revelation that was uh, that Joseph Smith gave, ye are my constitution for the kingdom of God. Um, in 1897, um, 50 years, more than 50 years after the revelation, uh, George Q. Cannon um, had this to say at a stake conference that was held um, in Paris, Idaho. He said, there was an attempt made during the life of Joseph Smith by some of the priesthood at the prophet's request to write a constitution for the kingdom of God. A committee was appointed of the most capable men. They tried and tried to draft it, and so did the prophet himself, but all in vain. And Joseph sought the Lord and told them, Ye are the constitution of my church, and so it is. The priesthood and the living oracles are the word of God unto us, and this constitutes the growth and strength of the kingdom of God. What's striking in um, President Cannon's rendering of this story is he changes the words of the revelation. Instead of ye are my constitution, he says, ye are the constitution of my church. And that reflects the theological shift um, and afterlife of these ideas. These ideas that were developed initially for this political kingdom of God, and ultimately, while they were initially kept separate, they merged together with the idea of the church as a governing body, and the church as the repository of uh, divine revelation. And in that sense, Mormons today live in a world right, and under a government, an ecclesiastical government, that's very much like the ecclesiastical government, or not very much like, but has echoes of the model of ecclesiastical government that was revealed, or government that was revealed to Joseph Smith in April of 1844. I hope that while you have been listening to these talks that and questions that begin to occur to you, because after our final comment by Kathleen Flake, uh, you'll have a chance to raise whatever issues you have. This is an unparalleled opportunity. <clears throat> this uh, this uh, remarkable, luminous, controversial, high-energy document and this group of experts. So I hope you'll make the most of it and uh, have questions to to ask. Kathleen Flake is the first occupant of the Mormon Studies Chair at the University of Virginia. She came here from Vanderbilt, where she taught American religion in the Divinity School. She began professional life as an attorney in Washington, D.C., but moved into scholarship via an M.A. degree at Georgetown University in Ritual Studies. She received her Ph.D. in American religion from the University of Chicago Divinity School. Her dissertation was published as The Politics of Religious Identity, the seating of Senator Reed Smoot, Mormon Apostle. She has published 
on Mormonism in Sunstone, the Journal of Religion, Religion in American Culture, Church History, Christian Century. Her current work is on 19th century Mormon polygamy. Her Arrington lecture at the Utah State University was published as the emotional and priestly logic of plural marriage. There's a title that intrigues you. You must look that, that essay up. It's very, very enchanting. I think we can rely on Kathleen for an illuminating insight into Mormon thinking in 1840s Nauvoo. Thank you, Richard. I'd like to take a minute and invite anyone who would like to take a chair to come up front if you if you feel you would. I hate to see you standing in the in the hallways there, so please feel free to come forward and take a seat. It won't disturb any of us at all. When people ask me what I did with my summer vacation, I told them I read 800 pages of business meeting minutes in the 19th century. And they, did, they didn't seem particularly interested after that, but um, I have decided to uh, organize my remarks with, with that experience in mind. I, I loved reading these minutes. I find that though I approached them with some trepidation, as I said, they weren't beach reading, but I wasn't on any beach, so it was fine. But I think that not many of you are going to get through all of these 800 pages, and so I'd like to share with you what I saw. And it might intrigue a few of you to, to at least read a portion of this. So tonight I'm going to focus on three things that I found most interesting about this volume. And first I will say a little bit about the, how the minutes reveal the personality of historical figures we know only in their representative capacity as illustrations of larger ideas and events, events like Zion's Camp, those of you who know Mormon history, or the first British missionaries, or the first everything in Mormonism. These are the guys, and for that matter, um, but the everything, the everything is to the point of their appearance, and everything else is the point of their appearance in the record. And they frequently remain, the people themselves remain largely unknown as personalities. In these minutes of the Council of Fifty, William Clayton has captured, as Matt indicated, something of that personality. We hear often the cadences, even the pitch of their voices as they openly express their concerns and competing recommendations on big problems, either because of the length of their deliberations or the freedom they felt from the expectation of secrecy. Their speech is spontaneous and unguarded, and, guard, and unguarded enough to be both poignant and amusing to a degree I have not seen in many official records. My second general takeaway is a renewed respect for the chaos that reigned in Nauvoo immediately before and the long 18 months after Joseph Smith's death and the eventual abandonment of the city. There are, I think, if, if you're willing, three dates to keep in mind. The minutes begin in March of 1844. Smith dies that June. So Smith only leads this council for three months. Brigham Young will become the chairman of the council. He faces a set of circumstances you can imagine after Smith is taken out of the organization. The next date is much less well known, but, but a very significant one. In January of 1845, the Nauvoo Charter is revoked. And I'll talk about that more in a minute. Then, of course, you have the year of 1845 with increasing violence. The Latter-day Saints go west on February 4th, 1846. So these minutes, this volume of the minutes, tell the story from March of 1844 until late January, 1846. So I, again, in one sense, I have known this history for a long time, just like I have known the count of the council members. But these minutes give a particularly close view of, the, of official efforts to respond to, survive, and escape the dangers and betrayals within and without the church between 1844 and 1846. Finally, it seems to me that this volume provides the missing link between Eastern and Western Mormonisms as, as scholars have seen it. 
The minutes require reconsideration of the popular belief that the church under Brigham Young was categorically different from that of Joseph Smith's design. In sum, my focus tonight will be on the character, the chaos, and the continuity as distinctive features of this record. That's an homage to Neil Maxwell. I didn't intend it to be, but I think it fits. At the first meeting of the council in March 1844, we were inter introduced to a group most of us think we know well, Brigham Young and Joseph Smith, of course, but also John Taylor, Heber Kimball, Orson Hyde, George Albert Smith, and those are George A. Smith, and others who comprised the standing councils of the church such as the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, most obviously. Others, less well-known, Joseph Fielding, George Miller, James Emmett, William W. Phelps, were included because they represented other councils and committees in Nauvoo. The administrative structure of Nauvoo was all represented in this council. And, or they are brought into the council because they have particular expertise to execute the council's plans for Nauvoo's defense or its abandonment. It is a big council, obviously by its name. Imagine then, imagine attending meetings where all these people speak on any given day and often all day. Necessarily then their deliberations were covered by rules of order, one of which is the reason why we were able to hear their voices so distinctly and at such length in these minutes. Specifically at their first meeting, President Joseph Smith directed the members to, quote, speak their minds and to say what was in their hearts, whether good or bad. End of quote. He emphasized the point by saying, he, this is William Clayton, of course, representing him, he did not want to be forever surrounded by a set of doughheads. And if they did not rise up and shake themselves and exercise themselves in discussing these important matters, he would consider them nothing better than doughheads. End of quote. The implicit insult in this remark was made plain by his saying this immediately after the council had lauded itself for being of one mind. It is then, after their self-congratulatory enthusiasm for agreeing with one another, that Smith accuses them of being doughheads or too malleable to be of use in resolving the dilemmas facing them. A month later, he returned to this theme, saying, quote, the reason why men always failed to establish important measures was because in their organization they never could agree to disagree long enough to select the pure gold from the dross by the process of investigation. Thus, notwithstanding his constitution of the council is revelatory, as you've just heard said, they were by reason of contraries even if it meant disagreement, to obtain agreement on the best course. And he did require unanimity on the decision, but he demanded distinctiveness and difference in their comments. More, Smith wanted on the record that the freedom experienced in the council extended to matters of conscience, not merely opinion. Quote, for the benefit of mankind and succeeding generations, he, this is he, I wish it to be recorded that there are men admitted members of this honor, honorable council who are not members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, neither profess any creed or religious sentiment whatever to show, he says, I want to show that in the organization of this kingdom, men are not consulted as to their religious opinions or notions in any shape or form whatever, and that we act upon the broad and liberal principle that all men have equal rights and ought to be respected, and that every man has a privilege in this organization of choosing for himself voluntarily his God, end of quote. Non-members were merely a token presence at these first meetings, and whatever intention Smith had for, for more representation were frustrated, no doubt, by his death three months later and increasing hostilities between the, between the Mormon and the non-Mormon population. Nevertheless, Smith's intentions for a shared government were sincere. Oh, think, he said to the council, when a man can enjoy his liberties and has the power of civil officers to protect him, how happy he is. Smith was so, quote, animated, said Clayton, while speaking these words, that the ruler he was waving, quote, pretty freely, end of quote, was broken in half. <laughs> Others rose to the occasion. Brigham immediately said he hoped, quote, every tyrannic, tyrannical government be similarly broken. 
Uriah Brown, one of the three non-members, rose to thank the president for, quote, the liberality displayed in this body, end of quote, and Amasa Lyman joined in by observing, this is the happiest time I ever saw, and I never have been very unhappy. <laughs> and now I begin to feel the inconvenience of not having the capacity to enjoy more. Lyman continued, there is a spirit in it, in these aspirations for equal liberty of conscience and equal protection. He said, there is a spirit in it which demonstrates an eternal progress. It is like a fire in my bones, and I feel full and want to enjoy more. If I were to go according to my feelings, I would be perfectly ridiculous, he said. It is through such unrestrained commentary that one gets an unusually clear view of this time and without losing the personalities of the historical actors. But their deliberations were not always as cheerful as I have shared in these quotations. As others have noted, the council's expectations for a millennial peace were limited by the experience of the lion of mobocracy, not ready to lay down with the lamb. As a consequence, their speech was often bellicose, and you've heard some of it tonight, and full of recriminations against the American government and its lawless mobocrats. Especially after Smith's murder in June of 1844, the minutes, record, the minutes contain many expressions of rage. Rage, I would argue, fueled by fear, frustration, and disappointment. Fear of being exterminated again so soon after Missouri, we tend to forget that 1846 came only seven years after 1839. They were on the road again. So fear of being exterminated against, fr again, frustration that, uh, that not all the saints lived up to that idealistic title, but were fractious and petty, and no less feelings of inadequacy, as voiced by John Taylor's statement that their assignment to write a constitution seemed to design to show them what fools they were. All these feelings fed their more bombastic statements. In other words, the drums of war beaten in this council, I believe, are beaten with the sticks of fear and pain. Though no less surprising for that fact, they are better understood in light of it and not taken at face value. The questions that the council faced were big ones and their individual assignments were onerous. How to order the councils of the church after Joseph Smith's death. How to respond to the revocation of the Nauvoo, Char Nauvoo Charter, which left them without legal authority to record the, pro the transfer of property, to perform marriages, to maintain a police force or a militia to protect them against increasingly hostile neighbors. What to do about powerful schismatics like Sidney Rigdon, whose accusations were aggravating hostilities and destabilizing the church's branches. Should they abandon Nauvoo? And if so, do all need to go? And if so, how to finance the removal? Where should they go? Among the Indians, to the Great Basin of the Rockies, to Oregon, to the San Francisco Bay? What about the British membership and those scattered in the East and the South? And in the face of all these demands, should resources, scarce time and money, be committed to finishing the Nauvoo House or even the Nauvoo Temple? Nevertheless, their sense of religious empowerment was real, and they had confidence that they could find the way to escape and even triumph. They frequently reassured each other with testimonies of their priestly dominion over hostile principalities and powers. In these assurances, too, we see Smith's influence. To a nervous Orson Hyde about to go to Washington to represent the saints' claims to the United States Congress, Smith had said, quote, go and do the best you can. Act like a king and get the very best things done for us that you can. End of quote. Ten days later, George A. Smith exhorted his colleagues by congratulating them on their research, their assertiveness in making certain decisions. He said, our researchers, our researches have done us good. By taking this course, we gain wisdom and prudence much better than we would if we had sat down like chickens to wait for the Lord to give it, end of quote. 
They believed themselves to be kings, not chickens, and they had, they had been anointed as such, rulers of a real kingdom, a living constitution for the kingdom of God on the earth, albeit roughly hewn. They were, as Irving Stone romantically portrayed them much later, men to match my mountains. That they would go to the mountains was initially only one of several options. The minutes for 1845 make clear, however, that ultimately the mountains were their only option because after their many researches, they inevitably came back to Joseph Smith's agenda. In 1845, political changes such as the annexation of Texas the previous December, coupled with the revocation of the Nauvoo Charter in January, left the council feeling, quote, and this is Brigham Young, the yoke of the Gentiles is broke. The yoke upon the Latter-day Saints is broken. The, the Gentiles' doom is sealed. There is not the least fiber can possibly be discovered that binds us to the Gentile world, end of quote. At the close of their March 1st meeting, the council was, fo was focused on sites further west with renewed seriousness, and Chairman Brigham Young could say, in this thing, we are all of one mind. But Joseph Smith had always intended. Brigham Young summarized the council's oneness by saying, quote, we know this was one of Joseph's measures and my feelings are, if we cannot have the privilege of carrying out Joseph's measures, I would rather lie down and have my head cut off at once. To carry out Joseph's measures is sweeter to me than honey or the honeycomb. The time has come when we must seek out a location. There was, however, another of Joseph's measures which caused disagreement and even schism, namely the wisdom of finishing the Nauvoo Temple before they left. By January 1845, the walls were only up to the capstones. There was no roof or tower. Couldn't the carpenters working on the inside of the building be better put to making wagons? Wouldn't the resources asked of the British saints to provide the bell for the yet unbuilt, unbuilt tower be better put to getting passage on ships? The best estimate of completion was at the very earliest, late in the fall. Meanwhile, attacks on Mormon settlements were increasing. Young was sufficiently worried that his journal tells us, I inquired of the Lord whether we should stay here and finish the temple. The answer was we should. Others on the council disagreed. Both James Emmett and Apostle Lyman White, quote, rejected the priority of finishing the temple and argued for immediate removal from Nauvoo. Some went so far as to dismiss the authority of other apostles and stated, quote, the Lord would not accept the temple when it was built, end of quote. Eventually, both men departed, taking some believers with them. As you can imagine, this was deeply troubling to the rest of the council. Heber, Kim Heber Kimball's response was indicative. I don't want to go from this place, as did Lyman White and James Emmett and Sidney Rigdon. They went contrary to counsel. They have said this place would be destroyed and that we could not build the temple. And at the same time, they sent men back to burn the lumber that, we might, that might hinder the work, that they might hinder the work. I know the temple will be built and the saints receive their endowment." End of quote. On December 10, 1845, Kimball was proved right when the first of approximately 5,000 people began to receive their temple ordinances. A month later, the council met in the temple attic, where Young told them, when we leave here, my mind is to go just beyond the Rocky Mountains, somewhere on the Mexico, somewhere on the Mexican claim, and the United States will have no business to come there, and if they do, we will treat them as enemies. He continued, this was not the end of his vision, he said, now if we go between the mountains to the place under consideration, there will be no jealousies from any nation. But if we stop this side of the mountains, there will be complaints which will reach us. John Taylor had said when they were talking about California, because everybody agreed California was the place to go, that he wasn't much for desert. And so this must have, this must have been hard for him to hear. There have been some objections to the country because the land is high, but it is surrounded by very high mountains which will moderate the climate very much. If we can get to this place, we can strengthen ourselves and be better able to grapple with our foes. If we should go there, we can sustain ourselves comfortably and it will soon become the greatest market in America. At the same time, we would fill it up 
we would fill all the region to the coast and soon hold the balance of power over the whole country. When they next gathered on January 9th, they gathered as captains of 100 for the wagons trains going west. Three weeks later, the wagons began rolling out of Nauvoo. One of the chief contributions of this record is that it shows how Smith's final organizational act created a means for collapsing the standing church order, I would argue, and with the help of the Nauvoo Temple ordinances, reconstituted that order as an umbrella organization for relocating, as a coherent movement, thousands of believers under extraordinary duress over thousands of miles from East, South, and Midwest America, as well as the British Isles, to the isolated Great Basin of the Rockies. Smith may have theologized the Council of Fifty as an idealized millennial government, but this last council he created in his last months served as the means by which Mormonism's complex administrative structure as it had grown up in Nauvoo was packed up, put in a wagon, and refitted to the purpose of transplanting the movement in a fashion that fulfilled his measures. The council did not re reconvene until 10 months later at winter quarters, Omaha Nation on the west bank of the Missouri River. Shortly afterwards, Brigham Young addressed the gathered refugees, calling them the Camp of Israel on their journeying to the West. In calling them the Camp of Israel, he echoed not only the analogy, this is not nearly only a metaphor to Israel leaving Egypt, but quite literally a camp, a group of people on the move and resettling in the West. And this could not have been done by the bureaucratic quorum structure in Nauvoo. Whether Smith knew this, and of course Richard is the expert on, on, on Smith, so I, I raise this for him to comment on if he chooses, but my, my inexpert sense about Joseph Smith is he always lived at the edge of his light. Not even he saw what was possible and what he did. I think he truly intended this to be a millennial government, and it can be said that theologically the Mormons believe that ultimately this, this remarkable administrative bureaucracy that constitutes the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints will go away and what will be left will only be this family structure. And it is indeed that family structure that organized the wagons going, to get, going west together with the members of the Council of 50 as their captains of 100. Thank you. All that you've heard for the past hour, that you ask yourself, what is there that I see new? What, what comes forward that was not part of my image of, of Nauvoo before? And this is an opportunity for you to explore with these um, experts here uh, whether or not you're getting something straight. I'd also invite you to think of, um, of your image of Nauvoo. Nauvoo is probably the most uh, controversial period in uh, Latter-day Saint history. It's a time of ex extreme doctrines, high doctrines, difficult doctrines like uh, plural marriage. It's a time when Joseph Smith seems to be accumulating power. He's mayor, he's general, he's everything. So we wonder what's happening to his psyche. And it's a time of constant danger, of threat from all outside, uh, from all circles outside of Nauvoo. So I invite you to sort of think about how you envision Nauvoo and explore uh, it with these experts here. So I invite you uh, to, I see we have a mic over there, correct? Correct. So uh, wherever you are, you'll be amplified. That's what we all desire, to be amplified in <laughs> some way. Uh, so uh, I invite you uh, to offer your questions uh, along whatever lines please you. There you go, right there. Hi, I have uh, had occasion to take detailed minutes of meetings myself.
and I think they reflect my voice at least as much of the voice of the people for whom I'm taking minutes. Do we have any reason to believe that the personal voice of the people in this minutes is not in fact the voice of William Clayton, but is actually the voice of the people being recorded? He speaks in many voices. Uh, uh, certainly the minute taker always influences the minutes. Uh, Clayton does seem to be a remarkably accurate minute taker. We know that from other minutes he takes. Uh, the, there's a few times in the council meetings where he's not there and the quality of the minutes really <laughs> sort of fall off. Uh, I mean, there's, there's no reason to think that, that, that Clayton is editing the minutes or, or anything like that. I mean, my sense of that is that allowing for the influence of the minute taker is a pretty accurate representation of what happens. So the book seems to end in 1846, February. What happened uh, in the Great Basin? Uh, why did it not continue? Uh, it seemed that was their intent all along. Uh, what's the rest of the story? Essentially, when the Latter-day Saints reached the Great Basin, this mobile kingdom that Kathleen mentioned in her final comment becomes fixed again. And when, once it becomes fixed, having a, an ecclesiastical government overseen by a quorum of 12 apostles made it unnecessary to have this council of 50 whose purpose was mobility and resettlement and so forth. So in effect what happens is you get the council of 50 being absorbed into the church's ecclesiastical structure. Latter-day Saints often hear the terminology the church and kingdom of God on the earth and think of that as a single holistic structure and it is but in many ways at least during the period of these minutes, those structures were separated for a time. Rick, could I uh, follow up on that a little bit? The council is revived briefly in the 1880s by John Taylor, President John Taylor. That occurs at a time when the outside pressures for the United States government are mounting. And could it be said that the Council of 50 is really a device for withstanding pressure. When in Nauvoo, it's a time of high persecution, they're having to maneuver when they expect to be expelled, and that those conditions come up again in the 1880s. That's quite correct. Uh, in fact, last night, Kathleen and I were talking about this, and I mentioned that the minutes that we published as part of the Joe Smith papers are not all the minutes we have of the Council of 50 and that these additional minutes that we have, which we hope someday to make available as well, do reflect this time in which things become unsettled again and therefore the Council of 50 is revived. And then once the, this unsettled period is reconciled with the manifesto and events after that, that goes away. Mm -hmm. So if we remember, uh, am I saying that right, Klaus Hansen? in 1974, which seems very early, uh, wrote about this. It seems like what we hear, and what a beautiful accounting, Sister Floyd, that was just fantastic. Um, before Joseph Smith died, was it more about the theoretical kingdom? And after he died, was it more about getting them west? And, was, and is the Klaus Hansen theory that this thing had a lot to do with his martyrdom Justified in your reading in the current stuff, and also did we publish every single thing, every single minute from the Nauvoo period? I'll take the second question. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I'll say regarding the first question that it was a contributing factor, but not the major contributing factor. If you look at the events leading up to Joseph Smith's death there were lots of things that came together simultaneously. And you, you might wonder how were people like Klaus Hansen able to write on this topic before these minutes were published. The answer is that as with Greek and Roman classics, Hebrew and Greek scripture, 
There were various redactions of the minutes made over time for various purposes, and some of those redacted minutes were, were available for research uh, in historical periods of the past, and Klaus Hansen and others had access to those. But contrary to what you may have heard, this is the first time that the minutes of, in their entirety have been published. And I've seen all of those minutes over time, and this volume is far and away the weightiest volume in terms of capturing what really happened in the Council of 50. Um, on your point about the sort of practical versus uh, theoretical, as I read the minutes, and I, I read all of them uh, this summer as well, actually at the beach, um, <laughs> and swim practices for my kids, um, that revelation that Joseph Smith gives where he says, you are my constitution, one of the things that that does is it does, it, it does I think, is a sort of transitional period where they start getting a lot more practical and they start spending a lot more time talking about what are we going to do in Texas or what we can we do uh, with the Indians. And this, this idea of sort of creating these imaginary republics and figuring out exactly what they're going to do, I think, is really secondary to the practical issues that they start grappling with pretty quickly. You may have just answered part of my question, but Give my us question your name. is... Let's have some names from people. My name is Larry Sidwell, and my question has to do with the uh, uh, viability of the uh, of the uh, CEO democracy that uh, was attempted to be set up, uh, whereas the, the, the uh, civil government is in the hands of the prophet, and uh, how, that, how that would have worked, and do you think it would work? Uh, we know what how it worked in uh, Europe under the church-state system, and we we know in Alma how it worked when the chief judge and the uh, and the uh, uh, high priest were the same. Uh, the Amalekites and the Zoramites had no place to go except to the Lamanites. So uh, I'm just wondering if uh, this could possibly ever work in a situation where we really don't have uh, Christ upon the earth. I, I think you, and, and I'm looking down the table here because I see the two gentlemen at the end would know more than I because this isn't my period of history, but um, I liked your question, Larry, and, and thank you at, uh, for it. I, I think we did see them, I did see it work, actually. It was convenient that Brigham Young was made the territorial governor. And until the army was so unkind to come and dethrone him, I think you, you saw their version of theodemocracy until 1857 in the Utah Territory. And it did seem to work with their bishops as their judges, right, their local judges, and Brigham Young as the executive officer, the Council of 50 in the legislature, largely, right? Yes, and after after that period, there was still a kind of shadow government that would meet the, mm -hmm. the members of the legislature would meet formally, and then they'd meet informally in order to essentially accept what they had voted upon formally in the in the formal government offices. So it continued for s some time in this what you might call hard and soft way. Oh, one one thing that I I think is interesting in in. If, if we take Kathleen's statement, right, that that's the theodemocracy is 1847 to 1857. Um, they, they don't create um, very novel legal mechanisms. So in the Utah period, uh, even in that early period, they basically copy all of the legal institutions of the United States. Uh, and so there's actually not a lot of legal innovation in how it is they set things up. What is very innovative about is how they organize their politics. Uh, so one way you can think about theodemocracy as it gets realized in the Utah period to the extent that we think that's what's happening is that there's very little legal innovation in what they're doing, but there's a great deal of innovation in the sort of political culture and the politics of how they do it. One innovation they do have in the legal sphere, and it's not unique. You can see this in at least one other part of the United States. They, they make their probate courts courts of original jurisdiction for criminal and civil matters that essentially run parallel to the established territorial courts, the courts whose justices are appointed by the 
federal government. That creates tensions in Utah until the 1874 Poland Act passed by Congress eliminates that jurisdiction for the probate courts. My name is Josiah Griffin. Um, so following the death of Joseph Smith, do the minutes describe or reflect a direct um, transition of leadership to Brigham Young? Or is there a period of time where the council um, is without a leader or, uh, or other uh, people leading the council uh, following Joseph Smith's death? So the council doesn't reconvene for about seven months. Uh, so Smith is killed June 1844. The council reconvenes February 1845. So there's no meeting, no minutes uh, during that period. When it reconvenes, it's it, they reconvene the council within three or four days of receiving notice of this revocation of the city charter. So that that's the kind of the spur to recreate the council. And it's very clear that Brigham Young is in charge. Uh, the council on the first day they reconvene accept Brigham Young as the standing chairman of the council. Uh, they then expel all of the members of the council who have uh, left the church and the schisms that happened after Joseph Smith's murder. So there's, there's, there's a shift of about 20 members in the council. Uh, some men have died. Uh, uh, 13 or 14 men are expelled from the council for various reasons. And then uh, they accept Brigham Young as chairman, then they add members until they get back to around 50. So, so, so it is clear Brigham's in charge. I thought I saw that transition. I'm sorry, forgive me if I repeat. I'm trying to get Glenn to go up to the row over here to get a question next, okay? Not, you get this question and then go next, okay? Um, I was surprised to see the, tra at least I thought I saw a transition to Brigham Young quite speedily. At first you see them all talking and exchanging and and eventually it becomes, they, they state, um, and there's a little bit of discussion about it, but the conclusion they come to is, well, we talk about these things in principle, and then the chairman, who was Brigham Young, will execute them. And um, it, it's not just a matter of detail. They, they, they give their feelings and their thoughts. They come to an agreement on a principle, and then, and then Young is definitely the executor of the council and certainly by mid-1845, if not, if not, I think after the, when they go into the crisis of the revocation of the Nauvoo Charter, Young really becomes um, the leader. Uh, good evening, Tom Tolman. Uh, two questions. First, Brother Bushman, uh, did you uh, learn anything from the, the minutes that you would uh, if you were to rewrite rough stone rolling, would you add it in? Uh, and then my second question, probably for Sister Flake, uh, you, uh, we've talked a bit about the confidentiality of the council. Um, also, we know during this period there was the very confidential practice of plural marriage. Uh, Sister Flake, you mentioned that they did discuss performing marriages. What overlap, or was there any indication of overlap between plural marriage and the Council of 50? I, I would uh, underscore one word, uh, desperation. The, uh, the intent of these people is to abandon the United States. It has so abused them. And Rick gave the, the trail of tears from um, Missouri in 1831 uh, into Nauvoo. Uh, and it, by the time that they'd gone through all of those difficulties without any redress from any government institution. They were really in a hopeless state. Nothing they had tried had worked. And uh, it shows up in these, minute, in these minutes. Glenn, over here. No, no over here, please. While, while uh, Glenn is doing that with a mic. Dave, this is for you. Let me just quickly answer the other question in terms of secrecy. Uh, it's, it's difficult to credibly characterize the degree of secrecy in Nauvoo during this period because we are so inclined to distrust secrecy. People who, who we assume people always have something to hide. And in this case, they did have something to hide, but their reasons were the reasonable expectation of, of harm. And that's true about polygamy, and that's true about the Council of 50. The Council of 50 was not merely worried, not only worried because 
they were um, talking about theocracy, not just theodemocracy, but theocracy. And, but they were afraid that their enemies would find out their plans and seek to frustrate them. So they were kind of damned if they do, damned if they didn't. On the one hand, they wanted, there were people who wanted to run them out, and there were other people who wanted to trap them and destroy them. And so the, their reasons for secrecy had to do with trying to protect their planning so they could make um, a, a safe exodus without meeting um, resistance. Uh, I, I think that many of those same reasons go for the practice of plural marriage. Uh, I, I think uh, you see both the dynamic of the, the reasonable expectation if others knew about this alternative form of marriage that they would seek to destroy the saints. In addition, I, I think uh, th there's no question that they were concerned that people would, quote, run where they were not sent. That if this became generally understood, there would be people, as in the Book of Mormon account, who take it upon themselves to go do it and would destroy themselves and the church in the, prog in, in the process. So secrecy was in service to control, absolutely, institutional uh, interest and control. There is, some, there is some mention of polygamy in these minutes, but the, um, the concern is the illicit practice of polygamy rumored by Sidney Rigdon, uh, possibly practiced by others. And so, that, so it comes up in the council meeting just, just a couple of times, but there, it's part of the concern about the chaos in Nauvoo. That's that. Dave Weedman, I guess I was um, su pleasantly surprised by Joseph's encouragement that uh, uh, what were the words, Kathleen? That they not be doughheads. That they, they not be doughheads. Yeah. yeah, they not be doughheads. That's that's a fantastic phrase. I'll have to hold on to. Um, but that they speak their mind and uh, bring counsel, bring experience to the council. Is that seen in Joseph's character in any other times in in his life? And I think he answered the, the next question. But did did Brigham continue it? Was his style different? Uh, in the amount of candor and openness and discussion that went on uh, with, within the minutes. Thank you. Actually, I can speak uh, as well for Joseph as, and for Brigham as well for Joseph. Just by chance, I was reading through the Journal of Discourses, uh, recording events at a general conference in the tabernacle. And Brigham Young is about to present the officers of the church. And he says, now when these names are presented, I don't want you to hold back. If you have any objections to any of these people, please speak out. It was almost an invitation to criticism. It sounded very strange. I think probably there was someone in the group of names being presented that he didn't like. And he, <laughs> he wanted to nail him on the spot. But it, it still uh, was presented as a general principle that there should be candor in that sort of situation. This, this may be outside of me speaking outside of anything that I can claim expertise is, but I do think one thing that changes with Brigham Young is the fact that Joseph Smith is murdered. Um, and uh, I think Brigham Young very much blamed uh, dissenters from within uh, the church for Joseph Smith's murder. Uh, and because of his love of Joseph Smith and also just the horror that that can happen, I think he tended to be less tolerant of dissenters than Joseph Smith did because he'd gone through that experience. Joseph, what did Joseph do at this point in history? Or did he, uh, he get slammed in or opened the envelope? One thing that's interesting about Joseph, we think of him as having all the power to himself because he has this immense authority of the prophetic voice. You think he would just run everything. But instead, almost from the beginning, he is reluctant to make decisions without drawing a council around him. And he does it informally at first. Whoever happens to be in town, he would bring them together into a council. After a while, they be becomes routinized in a regular organization. But he loved that idea that we all have a voice in, in these, these things. Uh, one of the things you talked about was uh, an insight into the psyche of Joseph Smith. And of course, one thing that concerns us all here is the psyche of our presidential candidates and the uh, how they're impacted by others. And I know it's just a short time between March and, and, and June, but um, 
What is there anything in the notes that, that uh, of course, it talks about in the synopsis that uh, they did have an objective of helping Joseph with his presidential uh, candidacy? Is there anything in the notes that that uh, talks to what impact they had on his on Joseph Smith's presidential campaign? Russell's impact on the campaign. So it's within the council that they select his vice presidential running mate. Uh, they actually, as a council, uh, contact two uh, prominent non-Mormons who had shown some friendliness to the church. Uh, both of them declined. Uh, they didn't hear back from one. Uh, and then they nominate Sidney Rigdon. Uh, it's, the, the council talks a fair amount about the details of the presidential campaign, what the slogan should be, uh, how uh, the campaigning missionaries should be sent out, how many and to where. So they're quite involved in the details of the campaign. Hi, um, Ruth Thomas. Um, I'm interested, Matt, you brought up this idea that there were these very separate sort of spiritual then temporal roles of of the council. And as you kept talking and as, and as the others in the panel kept talking, I had a really hard time keeping straight which ones were supposed to be spiritual and, and which ones were temporal. As maybe uh, illustrated by, y you kind of mentioned that, they're pro that they talked about Joseph Smith as the prophet, priest, and king. Right. But then they were also to understand that this was not a theological thing, but a king was a political leader, even though that phrase comes straight out of the catechism and is, is an essentially Christological phrase. So maybe my question is twofold. Could you illuminate a little more if, if and what types of separations there were between the spiritual and the and the temporal kind of senses of what the kingdom was and what the council was. And second, can you illuminate how well the council of 50 members themselves understood, if at all, those differentiations? I'll say something and then I'll pass it to someone else to clear up the confusion that I helped to cause. <laughs> Um, the, there's a really interesting moment in the council about a month after it's organized. Uh, and the way that they sit in the council is in a big circle. And Joseph Smith at the head, the oldest man to his immediate right, the next oldest, so on around the council till the clerks is next to Joseph. And he raises a question, and that question is, what is the relationship between the kingdom of God and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And the idea is that when a question like that is raised, every member of the council has the opportunity to speak on the matter. So Kathleen's not joking when she says that these meetings would go all day. They'd meet three or four hours in the morning, break for lunch, meet three or four hours in the afternoon. And they discuss it all day, and, it, and there's all sorts of different opinions. Well, obviously the Church and the Kingdom are the same thing. Right? No, there's a distinction between the church and the kingdom. And at the end of the day, Joseph uh, Smith sort of lays out his ruling. And the ruling is that the church and the kingdom are separate and distinct. Right? So, so Rick re refers to this phrase that Mormons sometimes use, the church and kingdom of God. He's saying, no, those are distinct. Right? And so in the, in the kingdom of God, uh, there's not the teaching of doctrine. There's not appointing bishops or apostles or ecclesiastical officers. There's not religious rituals done in the kingdom of God. Uh, those are reserved for the church. And he says that the, the role of the church is to lead us to spiritual salvation in the hereafter. The role of the kingdom, he says, is to make it so that uh, we have space, a political space, geographical space to practice that religion. Does that help? That's terrific. That's very good. Hi, Carrie Harding. Um, I'm not sure who the pers best person is to answer this question, but between the period when the prophet dies and they decide to go west, 
Uh, the leaders of the church are also dealing with what I would call the Jacqueline Kennedy issue of the time. You have a, gr a grieving widow who's also the first lady of the church. Um, do any of the minutes reveal any of the controversy or dissent or discussions on separating um, church versus personal assets, how to handle the, the public relations nightmare of the, the president's wife who's not going to go west with them and some of those Emma-related issues that any corporate board of directors might be forced to address? I, I only remember one comment yeah. where Brigham, uh, Brigham Young objects to people going and begging Emma to go west. That's the only comment. Do you remember another? No, the, the Emma's mentioned once, and yeah. it's in this context. There is some discussion about uh, the Nauvoo House, which is part, which was partly personal property, partly church property. So there's some discuss There's a little bit of this asset discussion, but it's not much. This gives me an opportunity to say something I I wanted to say, but was too jealous about my 15 minutes. Um, the notation in this book is extraordinary. So if you're a little concerned about diving into what is an original source and reading it without context, the notations in this will give you the best background I have ever read on the, the events around and the circumstances of Joseph Smith's murder and, and much else that goes on, including the negotiations, not negotiations is too fine a word, including the efforts by some to encourage Emma to go west and many, many other things in church history. So the book, while it's, it is a, a document, a, a, a record of minutes, the notations in it give you a church history that, that you would enjoy. I think that's actually a lovely note to end on, Kathleen. It, it truly is a magnificent piece of work. And you, you and your teams are to be congratulated. And let's congratulate this wonderful panel of people who brought their expertise here today.